Yeah. Martin, will you signal to me when people? I think so. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, excellent. I think we're ready to begin. Welcome everybody. My name is Dr. Toby Simpson. I'm the director of the Wiener Holocaust Library. It's my pleasure to be here this evening to welcome you to tonight's book talk, The Last Letter by Karen Baum Gordon. Uh, it's my privilege and honor to, to be here to welcome you. I'll just say a few words about the library. For those of you who haven't been here before, the Wiener Holocaust Library is Britain's largest collection of original material relating to the Holocaust and other genocides. And uh, it's actually the world's oldest collection of its kind. It's the only archive that has been continuously collecting evidence of Nazi crimes since the 1930s. It was established in Amsterdam by uh, the eponymous founder, Alfred Wiener. And uh, he did extraordinary work, even under ex the extreme pressure of himself uh, being an active opponent of the Nazi regime, first in Germany, then in Amsterdam, came to Britain and, and brought an extraordinary collection with him, which has continued to build over the decades into what the Wiener Holocaust Library is today. Um, the collections here include a huge amount of documents, photographs, letters, especially, uh, which will be a theme of tonight's talk. And our reading room is open to the public. Um, you don't need to make an appointment to come here. So for those of us joining from home and those in the room, I very much hope you will uh, either visit again or, or uh, come and visit us perhaps for the first time um, and use these extraordinary collections. So among the various activities that the library does is exhibitions. And currently we're hosting an exhibition entitled Holocaust Letters. Uh, this exhibition explores the way in which letters demonstrate something that you can't understand from any other source on this history. Um, the way that the knowledge of what was happening emerged in very personal ways in information exchanged between family members, um, often expressing the most poignant details about what they were going through. Um, tonight, we're going to be hearing a, a, a talk about a recently published book, The Last Letter, on this very theme. Um, and I'm uh, extraordinarily excited to hear more about, uh, about the book because it's a deeply personal book based on the, exactly the kinds of documents that we've unearthed for uh, the Holocaust Letters exhibition. And so I'm delighted that this is part of the programming. There are several talks and lectures that we've organized in conjunction with the exhibition. And this is one of them that I'm especially excited about. So uh, we will be hearing from Karen Gordon, who is a graduate of Harvard College and Columbia Business School. She, she has since founded Strategic Horizons Incorporated, an executive coaching and management consulting firm. A Dallas native, now living with her husband and Black Lab in Brooklyn, New York, uh, an active member of the Brooklyn Heights Synagogue, who recently served as the president of the congregation. Uh, Karen Baum Gordon, um, was inspired, of course, to write this letter by her own family history and her encounter with these extraordinary letters that are the subject of this uh, brilliant book. So I'm sure you will be as excited as I am to hear from Karen Baum Gordon. Karen, if I could welcome you to the book. Thank you. I'll take my, so that is my dad, obviously, but I'm gonna, gonna, uh, Take them off the screen for the moment. Um, so first, I just want to say thank you to the Wiener Holocaust Library. Thank you to Christine, who said yes uh, when the request came through, and to you, Toby, and um, as well, Martina and Maddie, and those who made it possible. And thank you to each of you who are here in person tonight to take time out of your Tuesday evening. And those of you uh, joining us via Zoom, I'm, I'm very uh, grateful uh, to have you here. Um, so let me share with you top line of the, of the book, and of the story. So the story is my father at the age of 21 left Frankfurt, Germany in 1936, left his parents, his sister had already emigrated to what was then Palestine, and came here to the States. He ended up joining the American army, became a naturalized citizen, and then he participated in the liberation of Buchenwald. Um, his parents ultimately did perish in the Holocaust uh, in the witch ghetto, 
Um, and at the age of 86, my father, uh, who was the most extroverted in the world, um, very engaged with, with life and community, uh, attempted to take his own life. Um, he went on to live seven years, thanks to modern medicine, but didn't remember anything about that attempt. Um, so I want to pause for a minute and just say, you know, the, the timeliness of this, the, the separation of families, you know, when we, uh, whenever I see those pictures um, of the war in Ukraine and see those little, little faces smushed against the bus windows and the parents on the sidewalk, I have to say, I, I have uh, such a strong reaction. And, um, and here, here we are again. Um, so I, I set out to solve a mystery. I did not set out to write a book. And I'm not a historian. I'm not a scholar. Um, but my mystery I wanted to solve was my father left a note. And it said, I am a tortured soul. So what was that? I mean, really, if you met my dad, he did not come across as a tortured soul at all. Uh, so I set out to understand that. And thank you to letters and archival documents uh, and a host of other primary research uh, and secondary research. I feel like I, I solved, I did solve the mystery, but the letters were a cornerstone of it. Um, there were 88 of them. They were written, we were talking about it before in this old uh, a German script called Suderlin. Um, and uh, I solved the mystery. So before I go forward, I'd like to just share with you, I'm gonna read an excerpt from the book to just give you a flavor of it. Um, and I know some of you have even already read it, but you'll hear it again now in my voice. Uh, so this particular passage is when uh, my dear friend Lauren and I, I went to Frankfurt three times and Poland once in my journeys. And we were in search of uh, the second residence where my grandparents and my father lived. He, they lived for 19 years in one house, he, he did. And then the last two years he was there, um, they had lived in this other house. They were uh, basically evicted a few times. So we were in search of this second house. So Lauren and I then walked from Reuterweg 73 in search of Eisenachstrasse 20, where my grandparents and father had moved to in 1934. As we continued on our way in a thin veil of continuous drizzle, we juggled our cheap umbrellas and half-torn maps and struggled to read the street signs. We meandered along, marveling at the rainbow-colored rows of elegant mansions, each white, but each with a different accompanying color trim of pink, blue, yellow, and orange. And then we stumbled upon a lush forest green blanket, the Holtzhausen Park. Just on the other side of it, we entered a wide street with its breathtaking allay, a 50-foot grass carpet rolled down the middle, symmetrically lined with trees more than 100 years old. Checking the map, we realized, ah, we are on Eisenachstrasse. Like well-preserved grand dames, Eisenachstrasse's majestic homes reflected the time and attention they had received over the years. We arrived at number 20, pale pink with four cherub friezes on its facade. Lauren and I puzzled over which floor belonged to my grandparents. Then seemingly out of nowhere, a drenched young woman on a bicycle approached the front gate. Well, I quickly shifted from a relaxed picture-taking mode to determined detective. In my very poor German, I asked if I could accompany her to meet whomever was gonna be buzzing her in. The next minute I was chatting with a 40 something dark haired man, handsome and slight, who not only grew up in this house, but also was the current owner. Alex Zahn, he said, by way of introduction, Zahn as in teeth in German. And yes, I could come in. Upon entering, I noticed the polished mahogany band banister with its countless nicks and scratches, some of them from cherished wedding bands they wore or from sharp edged packages they moved in or out. As we walked upstairs to the duplex apartment, I savored each step. On the third floor, 
I met Alex's elderly mother, who explained that she and her husband bought the house from the children of the original owners. Well, that would have been the Hermans from whom my grandparents had rented. We proceeded to the fourth floor. The apartment's entryway was relatively large and the bathroom off the entryway was huge. What would have been my grandparents' kitchen was now a clothing storage room. I peered out the small window in the, quote, kitchen, imagining my grandmother uh, as she was um, uh, making her famous grunasosa, that green sauce. Alex then showed me the large master bedroom with its window overlooking the LA and then the sitting room with a desk. I pictured my grandmother sitting at such a desk, gazing out and writing those cherished letters to my father. Then we entered what must have been my father's bedroom. It was small, but with two windows, one looking out over the LA and another on the air shaft. It was there that my father slept his last night under the same roof as his parents that he dreamt his last dreams in Frankfurt. So you can tell even from that passage, uh, there were ordinary people helping an ordinary person like me along on my journey. And I wanna share with you a few of those folks. So the first such person um, was somebody by the name of Nat, who was a neighbor of ours. We live on a little one way, one block street in Brooklyn. And this man had uh, attended the same, he had also attended uh, college where I did and uh, 25 or 30 years before me. Um, I didn't know him particularly well. Um, but one day I ran into him shortly after my dad had passed away and I had delivered a talk at our synagogue, a spiritual journey in the form of a letter written to my grandparents who had uh, perished. And he said, oh, if you wouldn't mind sharing that, I would love to read it. So I slipped it in his mail slot. And the next time I ran into him, he said, you know, and he was an editor at McGraw Hill for a lifetime. He said, you know, you have a book inside of you. And I was like, uh, I don't think I have a book inside of me. No, I mean, I'm getting these letters professionally translated and I'm, yeah, I'm writing a few uh, essays here and there. I'm keeping a journal, but uh, I don't think there's a book here. Um, well, one thing led to another, uh, to another, and I would put these essays in his mail slot. This is like out of the old times. In his mail slot, he would line edit them with a pencil, sometimes give me big picture ideas, drop them back in my mail slot. And this went on for three or four years. He was a very private man, and he only would come to our house once a year on his birthday and have a cup of tea. And... Uh, one particular year, I learned that he had grown, I knew he grew up in Atlanta, that's all I knew. He grew up around the corner from Martin Luther King Jr. His mom and Martin Luther King Jr.'s mom used to play bridge together. And he actually helped write some of Martin Luther King Jr.'s speeches. So I feel very blessed that this man came in my path and that he said what he did. Um, the second such person I met was uh, somebody that I met where else? Over the internet is how I found her. So I was in search of, my father did not know what happened exactly to, he knew the conditions under which his mother had uh, passed away, but he didn't know about his father. And I thought, I'm gonna find this out. So I tried this, I tried that. And then I went on the US Holocaust Museum's website and found a panel of four survivors um, in discussion. They were survivors of this ghetto. And I thought, well, I'll use good old fashioned whitepages.com. What's the equivalent here? Uh, same thing? It's called the same thing. Yellowpages.com. Yeah, okay. So I thought, I'm just going to look them all up. And I did. I left them all a message, a voicemail. I read anything I could about them online. So I was ready if they happened to call me back. And then the very next day, I'm out uh, for, bre for breakfast with uh, three girlfriends before my business day started. And my phone rings and I recognize this is one of those numbers. So I jump up, I go into the lobby of the restaurant. And at the other end is this woman who says, here's Dr. Solomea Cape. And I said, oh, and she had this incredibly um, high pitch. So try to hold this all in your head, high pitched, Julia Child-like voice with a Polish accent. That was Salomea. 
So we proceed to speak and she says, yes, I was 14 uh, when I was in the ghetto. I was born and raised in Wuch. Um, I remember the day the German Jews came in and we chat and we're now, you know, 20 minutes into the conversation. And I say, so Dr. Cape, I had read, uh, I, she had posted some essays online. I said, you know, I read this essay you wrote where you said you went to anatomy class. So she was born and raised in the town of Wuch, was an inhabitant of the ghetto, and then went to medical school in Wuch before going on to Palestine and New York. So there she is in medical school in Wuch after the war. And I said, you know, where you wrote that essay and you said you were in anatomy class and the cadaver was the body of the commandant of the ghetto. Was that true? Well, she said, of course it's true. I don't ever write anything not true. I mean, she was so insulted and so taken aback by my question. And I figured, okay, well now I have blown it all. This is it. So we proceed to chat. And at the end, I very sheepishly said, um, you know, if you were willing, like maybe um, could I drive up to, she lived in a suburb of, of New York City. Could I drive up and meet you for a coffee? And she said, no, I come in for lunch. We have lunch. We proceed to meet two weeks later for lunch a three hour lunch. Um, and during that lunch, I uh, learned from her, she says, well, if your grandparents perished in the ghetto, they're buried in the Jewish cemetery in which I said, they are really, I mean, I just assumed they were cremated. She said, of course. And she said, I'll talk to the caretaker of the cemetery. And she said, um, we will see. And I said, well, if there are graves, I'm on the next plane over. She said, and I will go with you. It will make it easier for you. I'm thinking easier for me, really? So fast forward, we do go. She and I, my two sons, her then 46-year-old son, the five of us ended up going. It was amazing. Um, and then uh, the third such person I want to share with you is somebody I met on, on this side of of the ocean um, in Frankfurt. So on this same day, the same rainy day that, um, that Lauren and I are out, um, we are going to first the first residence where my father lived. And we're intentionally walking on the other side of the street. It's, uh, the street is called Reuterweg. It's a very wide, very wide main thoroughfare. So we decide to walk on the other side so we can peer at it from, from afar at first. And sure enough, we come upon it and we're you know, huddled under this awning with our umbrellas and we're looking. And then I turn to Lauren and I say, okay, so it's time to go in. And she's like, what? And I said, well, we have to go inside. And she said, oh, no, 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 no. I am, what do you mean we're going inside? I said, we have to go ring buzzers and go inside. And she said, no, 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 I'm not, I am not doing that. So she stays put, I go across the street and I uh, look at the buzzer pad very carefully because I had planned ahead a few weeks before and had done the reverse address phone look up, look up in whitepages.com uh, and had reached two people, one of whom I'm certain hung up on me uh, during the conversation, it wasn't a disconnect. Uh, and the other one said, sure, you can come when you get to Frankfurt. Let's arrange the exact date and time. It's fine. Um, and then the next day I got an email from him that said, upon reflection, this is not a public viewing place and you are not welcome here. So, okay, so I'm going to avoid those two. But every other one, I just sat there and rang the buzzers until somebody buzzed me in. So I quickly opened the door and at the top of the stairway is a rather unkempt also 40 something year old fellow in his gym shorts and a bag of garbage outside the, the door. Um, and he says, was wollen Sie? what do you want? And I, again, in my broken German said, I'm just here to have a look. My father grew up in this building. Can I just have a look? And he said, yeah, yeah you can have a look. And I said, and, and can I come into your apartment? No. And he said, okay, I, I'm just having a look. So Lauren at that point came over. And, and for me, that was a really, um, to be in those spaces was incredibly moving. Um, to walk in the same spaces, to, to see the stairway that my dad, I'm sure, learned to climb stairs on, you know, the, the door handles that he learned to turn, it was all original. Um, and that was really quite incredible and quite emotional. Um, 
And so if I think about the, the emotional uh, part of this journey, you know, there were real, uh, what I would call emotional punches in the gut along the way. And the first such emotional punch in the gut was related, no surprise, to a letter. Um, so it was August 31st, 2009. It's good to keep a journal. <laughs> and our phone rings and it's 2009. So, you know, we still had a landline back then. Phone rings and it's Andy who was uh, the mentor and former professor of a dear friend who, and he had been born in Germany. He, he knew Suderling in the, anyway, he was able to translate this, the letters and he had done the first one or two, but then I said, can you translate the last letter for me? You know, it's kind of like a kid that can't wait to open their presents. I wasn't going to wait through 88 letters to see what was in the last letter. So he calls very spontaneously and says, so I'm ready to translate it for you, meaning like real time, like he's just going to talk it through with me. So I grab a piece of paper and a pen and uh, I start to scribble everything he's saying. And I end up in a complete puddle of tears. I mean, it was really um, gut wrenching to hear the last letter, the last letter. And so I trek downstairs and my, my husband and youngest son are watching uh, Baltimore uh, Orioles versus the Yankees in Baltimore. They see my face, they pause the game, uh, baseball game for, for those of you who don't know. Um, and, uh, and I proceed to read my, you know, through my tear blurred, tear, uh, tear blurred vision, um, my notes to them. They give me a hug and I go back upstairs and all I wanna do is now crawl into bed. And I like to read before I go to bed. So I grabbed the book I had just received that day. Usually I bring it with me to these talks, but honestly, it was too big to carry across the land. It's like this thick. It is the diary of the witch ghetto. It's literally this thick. Um, so uh, the uh, commandant and others had uh, demanded that a group of Jews keep a journal of everything going on. Of course, you keep journals of everything going on in the, in the um, ghetto, but not everything, you know, what they deemed as the important facts. However, there was an underground version of it. And this tome is an underground version and it does have everything. So normally, to be perfectly honest, a book like that, I would look at the table of contents, look at the index, look at the pictures, read a little here and there. But this, I wanted to savor every word. So I crawl into bed, I open page one, paragraph one, the introduction, which is really the editors explaining how the book is laid out. They pick a date, May 4th, 1942 which is the day my grandmother perished. And they say, so it's gonna talk about the weather like this. And then it's gonna talk about some mundane, mundane things that happened. And then if anything major happened. And there at the end of the paragraph, it talks about my grandmother having committed suicide that day. And I just couldn't believe it. Like page one, paragraph one, I just felt like the universe was speaking to me. This is unbelievable. It was just unbelievable. Um, so that was, that was at the beginning of, of the journey. And then, as I mentioned, um, I want to share with you when we went to Wuch, a little piece of that. So imagine the five of us meeting up in the Warsaw train station, right? We don't all know each other and we're about to spend like 10 days together. It's pretty bold. Uh, our sons were 2017, her son was 46, here we are. And I don't even know Salomea that well at this point, though she did become like a member of our family. So we meet up, we race to catch the train to, to Wuch because we have like three minutes to catch it after we connect. We get on the train, you know, we take a deep breath and then we get off the train in Wuch and I get all emotional, it doesn't take a lot but I really do. Like I get out of the train and I'm thinking, wow, so this is the vista. It's pretty desolate. This is the vista that my grandparents saw when they got out of the train. And, um, and this platform, which is rickety and old and definitely not touched, this is where they walked. And this old staircase that they carried whatever they had with them or were allowed to take down that staircase. And I was very emotional. We keep walking. There's no one around here. 
like no one. We keep walking. I mean, it felt like forever. I'm sure it wasn't more than a quarter of a mile at the time. It felt very long because it was kind of creepy. Um, we come upon a taxi and he says, oh, which? Oh, no, you got off a station too soon. So I'm thinking, oh, so that wasn't the platform. That isn't the vista. That's not, that's not the staircase. OK, so that was sort of an absurdly emotional, in a way, um, moment for me. Um, and then uh, the last one I want to share with you is uh, again in Frankfurt in 2013. I had gone there with some uh, distant cousins to um, participate in a ceremony of laying Stolperstein for my grandparents. So Stolperstein translates to stumbling stones. And some of you may know there's almost 100,000 of them now across Europe. And they are brass plaques set in front of the homes of people who um, perished in the Holocaust. And so I was there for this ceremony and um, these cousins are walking, oh gosh, a good um, 20 yards away from me. And I'm really walking by myself down the Zeil in Frankfurt. So the Zeil is a huge pedestrian walkway with shopping and it's very wide and it's actually quite beautiful. Um, and I'm happily walking by myself. And there out of seemingly nowhere is a street musician playing Que Sera Sera. Now, Que Sera Sera, and I'm in Frankfurt. My father had a booming voice. He had a, um, a very strong voice. He thought of going into radio, especially after his days in the army, um, but he did not have a singing voice. But the one song he would walk around the house singing and humming was Que Sera Sera. So again, it felt like, uh, wow, the universe really is, is speaking with me. Um, so the journey was incredibly meaningful. And somebody asked me today, uh, was, it, was it cathartic or was it burdensome? I do think for me, it was cathartic. I, I like to think I maybe diluted, um, diluted the multi-generational trauma for myself, for my sons. Um, and the rabbi of the synagogue that I grew up in, who knew my parents very well uh, for 35 years, he wasn't the rabbi when I was there, but he knew my parents well. And as after my book came out and he read it, he said, you know, he said, there's something that makes your book different. He said, usually with survivors, he said, we want to, you want to say, add a boy, add a girl. You know, you did it. You made it. You made a life for yourself. Good. He said, but we don't think about, which is what you do in your book, the surviving, the surviving every single day. And I have to say, I think that's what it was for my dad. He, I don't think those of us who were the closest to him knew that, but I think he was um, surviving the surviving every single day and um until he couldn't he, he it was just too much and um so i like to say to folks you know um if there are people in your life you want to know more about now's the time if they're still around don't wait because they're probably not going to be around as long as you want them to be and it's not worth waiting um, and if they are already gone, two feet in the internet and a little determination goes a very long way. Um, but do it now. Uh, it's, it's really worth the journey. Um, so with that, I'm going to now put a few faces to the names and also share with you just two or three documents and a, and a sample of the letters, um, just to give you a little flavor of it. Um, the clicker, which is where I can. There's a clicker there. Okay, there we go. So that's my dad at, at 80, after, after the repentance, at, uh, he's sitting on the bima at our son's bar mitzvah, and that really captures him. Um, and then this next picture is a picture of my dad and his sister. Uh, when he's nine and she's 11 in 1924. And I just think it's one of these great iconic pictures. And on the back of this picture 
Now, my grandmother was, she's a Reformed Jew from, descended from um, Rabbi Abraham Geiger, founder of Reformed Judaism. And then my grandfather was Orthodox. On the back of this picture, it says Easter 1924, <laughs> which I think is so interesting. Um, and then this next picture uh, is, you know, we're talking an ordinary life. Um, there's my dad on the left. It's, uh, he's 18, it's 1933. He's fussing around with a camera. He's, you know, he's happy, look at that. And then over here in the album, this is in 1934, it says underneath paddle boating, but it looks kind of like a combination of, I don't know what, uh, a kayak and a canoe and whatever else. And what's interesting to me is I yesterday um, uh, had the, great experience of going to the Imperial War Museum's Holocaust galleries and learned that part of what they wanted to accomplish in the beginning part was showing the ordinary lives of people. And, and this really, you know, here he was. Uh, this is his passport picture. He's uh, 20 there, that's in 1935. Um, and this next picture is really one of my favorites. It's in Marburg in 1945 and uh, he, after the war, and you all may know of this, I did not, um, but especially those of you in, involved in the world of journalism. So there was, um, in many cities, uh, my father, for example, headed up an army unit to create a free press in Marburg. My father knew nothing about journalism, newspapers, except reading them, nothing. Um, but he headed up a unit there, and this is in Marburg, and it's interesting, his time there, he will say the notion of collective guilt, which he certainly felt like when he went back, you know, that notion of everybody here is guilty, that really dissipated when he had to find an editor, he had to find a publisher, he had to hire reporters, and these were people that lived there during the war. So he began to see people as individuals, and I think that was a great gift that he handed down to the next generation. Um, and he would go back to Germany. He, he was able to do that. Um, this next one is pictures of my parents. Of course, they got married right before he went uh, abroad. Uh, so there they are in 43 and 44. And this next picture, if there's anything that captures surviving the surviving, it is this next picture. So this picture, um, what my father's pointing to is in the, that picture is in the book, uh, and it's the liberation of Buchenwald. So um, Pat, he was in Patton's army, and Patton said, I want the American soldiers to take the citizens of Weimar through this camp now, like, you know, the day or two after the liberation. And my father was part of that. In this picture, which uh, hangs in the Dallas Holocaust Museum, my father is pointing to himself and smiling. I mean, that is, I think, unbelievable. It is, I mean, I had seen the picture before, but after this journey I've been on and that he ended up on, it's pretty unbelievable. Um, and then these next pictures are of my grandparents. And uh, my father had these in a little, you know, those, um, uh, dual frames that fold, right? They're silver and they're like three by five or four by six. He had this by his bedside until the day he died. These exact pictures. And then these pictures were pictures, talk about letters. These were sent in a letter. And clearly my father sa said some comment indicating because uh, my grandmother wrote back and said, what do you mean we're putting on a face, which is very interesting. So they were sending these in 1938 to give some kind of message, but ostensibly maybe to have my father feel like it was all okay-ish. My father didn't really buy it evidently. And anyway, there was quite an exchange, but if you look at this, um, if you can see in that picture, it's hard to draw it. It's a little bit of the bracelet my grandmother's wearing there. Yes. Oh. Sure. So that bracelet in that picture is this bracelet. And I somehow, you know, 
know. Yeah, and that's a mystery. I don't know. Somebody clearly, I don't think my father brought this bracelet in his little trunk. I think somebody brought it and my grandmother said, here, take this to him. I'm not quite sure why, but I feel this is pretty great to have. Um, so these next few pages, I just want to share with you, you know, these are simple, accessible documents. I mean, simple, accessible, it takes a little doing, but it's not that hard to get the documentation. So, um, oh, come on, there we go. So on the upper, let's start with the center. The center, that is a letter. That's just an example. I think they're beautiful. I mean, I have them right now before they're donated anywhere else. I have them each onion skin page in, a, in an archival sleeve and an archival, archival binder. Um, I only handle them with gloves. I mean, I'm very careful, but they're really beautiful. That script is incredible, but I can read German and pretty much, but uh, that to me is illegible. So that's an example of a letter. In the upper left, that is page one of their restitution papers. Uh, everybody knows what I'm referring to where um, people like my father and aunt uh, file to get uh, monies for the loss of their parents and the, the assets, et cetera. Um, I essentially reached out to the archives in Hesse, which is the state where Frankfurt is in, and asked for everything that was in my grandparents' files and in my grandfather's business files. And it was like pulling teeth. I mean, I finally got something. And what I got was a JPEG for every single page which was tough. And then I, and it was, you know, I don't know, 10 documents. So I would piece it together and then I'd have to go back and say, uh, can you give me like page four from document one and page 12 from document two, where's it? this went on for some months, but I, I, I finally got, I don't know if I got it all, but I got a lot. Um, and then over here, I sat with an archivist at the Frankfurt Jewish Museum a couple of times. And these were the old, uh, phone books and went through, they have it in every permutation. They have it by address first, they have it by name, they list people's professions. So that was quite interesting for me to learn who owned their house, what other people did, who were the names. One of the names showed up in a letter as somebody my father should follow up with. So that was really quite, quite interesting. Uh, this next one is, I just like that my dad kept this. This is this is the log of the ship that he came over on. And, uh, you know, it's obviously to, this, to the minute of when they would enter each port. Um, and then these next pages, you know, this is the American Red Cross Tracing Service. Uh, I was just trying to get everything I could. Um, this is the manifest of the ship he came over on. That was from Ancestry.com. This one is the first document I got. I remember that's called the transmigration voucher. Um, that was with the Jewish distribution committee and shows that my dad um, had an account on file where he was saving monies to bring his parents over. And I remember like, you know, the wheel on my computer spooling when that was about to pop. And that was really a, a great moment. Um, and then this is Salome. I had to show Salome. And that just, you know, a picture speaks a thousand words. You can, you can get who she is in that picture. Uh, she was quite a force. Uh, she passed away about a year and a half ago. And then it was a family affair. Um, that's in Poland with my two sons. In the end, we had a plaque uh, put up because there were seven years worth of data missing. And in fact, we, there weren't tombstones. I'm sure there were, they were buried there, but there weren't tombstones. And then over here with my husband and two sons, that's in Frankfurt and at the tombstone of my great grandparents. Um, and last but not least, this is uh, my grandparents and these are the Stolperstein I referred to, which many of you have maybe seen in various, it's not just in Germany, it's in many other countries. Um, so with that, I'm, I'm really grateful that you um, gave me your attention and, uh, and are here today. And I'm open to questions and, any, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk for it. Thank you so much, Daniel. Yeah. Wow. Oh, there we go. 
something's happening. Uh, that's good. Um, absolutely fascinating, very moving talk. And I already got quite a sense of your family and the individuals. And I did want to ask a bit more, though, because that that correspondence, which sent, which took you on this this journey, this extraordinary journey, um, did it? How did it change? your understanding of the relationship between your father and his mother mm. because I'm guessing that you had kind of built a picture of that in your mind but maybe well uh, I just knew that I knew that his father was quite strict that I knew and I knew he was close to his mom but I didn't know a lot but I'll tell you those letters we're talking you know uh, during the times they were living in and she was saying things like well, are you darning your socks? Are you doing your laundry? And by the way, what did you have, you know, for Yom Kippur breakfast? What did you, what did you eat? Um, it was amazing. Or she would, she, she would micromanage. She said, don't think I didn't hear. I heard from so-and-so who heard from so-and-so that you were out late. <laughs> don't be, you know, running around. Or um, my dad said he had gone to the beach, I guess. And she said, don't get sunburned. I mean, she was really um, mothering from afar. Uh, the other thing that she did was is tell him to make sure you send uncle so-and-so a birthday card for his 60th birthday. Make sure you follow up with this one who's coming to New York, make sure. And actually, my sons, I have to say, sort of tease me about that because I think my uh, grandmother in many ways was the ultimate networker. Um, and I do think that was passed down to my dad. Um, I'd like to think I have a little piece of that looking at some of these faces out tonight, but I, I do really love staying in touch with people. And I think um, that was a whole part that I didn't know came from my grandmother. Mm. Um, but the other part, I just want to say a few more things about that. Um, you know, my grandmother would write things like, I just sit in your room. Or I make your favorite dishes still. And those are the things, you know, I can imagine as a mother writing that, but I cannot imagine receiving that. You know, what, what was that like for my dad? Um, so it was a combination of many things, but it did really clarify that relationship a lot more. Mm. Um, and actually you mentioned about your sons because I wondered what this was like for them because they must have also gone with you to an extent on this journey. Well, physically, they, they, they went literally on the, yes, they literally went on the journey, but also metaphorically in lots of ways. So I recently asked them because one of the things that's hard is when somebody says, what did your father think about that? Or what did your sons? And I thought, you know, I can ask my sons, what is the long shadow of the Holocaust for you? I had a whole story that I had in my head of what it was. And I asked them actually only about six weeks ago, I have to admit, but I'm telling you, this is a story that just, you know, it's a journey that keeps on going. So I literally called them up and said, so I have a question. <laughs> long channel but so my elder son Matthew said and I said you can think about it but I knew Matthew would answer right away he said well I think there's a few things one is he said when I um, hear about persecution he said I think it's different for me I think it's a little more proximate for me and for example so I asked him for an example because he needed to give me one so he said for example uh, you've all, I'm sure, you know about the uh, book bannings in the U.S., Mouse. And, um, he said, when I read and hear about the book banning, he said, I think about Grandpa Rudy being at the book burning. You know, it feels a little closer in. Um, it really does. And he said it's also made him more sensitive to mental health issues for folks. Um, so that was Matthew's answer. Adam's answer, who's the younger one, who, by the way, majored in German and computer science, did his semester abroad in Germany. Um, he said, you know, I'm still sorting it out. And he said, it's not accidental, I'm sure, that I majored in German. Um, but he said, I think I'm still reconciling it all. And, and he said, I was so glad he said this. He said, 
And he said, I think when I have kids one day, yes. Um, he said, I think I will, it will be even more clear for me. So it was really an interesting. Mm. I think one of the things that is completely fascinating about documents like letters is they're very much of the moment. And because of that, they're often quite messy. They, you know, they, they aren't, it's, you, <clears throat> they sort of take you to a moment where um, you see details that maybe don't fit in your preconceived ideas about a person. Yes. Um, and in, in amongst that mess and confusion, which I guess, you know, we all have to kind of take a long time to figure out and, and put things in order. And maybe it's not possible to put everything in order. Um, it changes our perspective, I think, in a Very most extraordinary much. way. Very much so. So I'll stop hogging the floor. Would anyone uh, in the room like to ask a question? Question, yeah. Karen's invited lots of journalists, of course they don't have questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> um, I wonder when when your your friend had sort of, um, translated these 88 letters, um, what was the thing that most surprised you from them? Oh, that most surprised me. Um, I would say the, the quotidian details of their lives. You know, my grandmother would talk about the curtains she hung in the new place. And I don't know what I was expecting. I guess I expected, um, I knew they were being censored, but it went everything from the curtains that were getting hung to, well, now I'm taking in a border. You know, there were all these, it was this juxtaposition of the everyday with, if you read between the lines, the what was going on. Well, I'm making felt flowers now and selling them. Well, that's kind of interesting. They were middle-class and quite comfortable before, but now they have a border and now she's making felt flowers. I mean, so I think it was, and yet, I mean, Jane, if you read these letters, I mean, some of them she had a sense of humor in, you know, it was like she could still, it wasn't all heavy. Um, so I think that really surprised me. Um, yeah. Could I follow up on that and just ask, that's quite a lot of letters. So for over what period of time were those, was that at correspondence? So this is a, a painful part of this, which is, you know, people sometimes say, so what's still unresolved? 88 letters written weekly from 1936, November, the day my dad left, she wrote a letter, November 17th, 1936, straight through to July 1938. Then, so every week, that's 87 letters. Then there is a three and a half year gap. And then there is the last letter, which actually interestingly is typed. The others are all handwritten. And I don't have those letters in between. And the only way I know they existed is that my dad, um, he wrote an, his own autobiography and he refers to the letters of the 1940s. So, I can tell you, my father was very organized. You know, he was super organized. He didn't lose them. So the story I tell myself, I'll never know, is that in a fit of depression, maybe at some point, although I'm telling you in my lifetime, he had three that I know of. But again, we're talking surviving the surviving every day. So maybe there was a moment when he said, I cannot have these letters. Because in the first 88, they're pretty ambivalent. They First of all, they start out, we're not coming anywhere. We're not going anywhere. Then they go, well, we think about Palestine, but no, Palestine's too hard of a life. We don't want to burden you. No, 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 no. All ambivalent until the last letter. So I think my father threw those out. And yet he saved the last one because it was the last thing his parents touched. That's the story I told myself. I'll never know. And that it's hard for me having that unresolved. That's, uh, that's like, I wish... Uh, that's one thing I just would love to know. Mm. So, thanks. So, Karen, you've got on this. 
extraordinary journey. I think a number of us know you from your professional life uh, where you're very clear eyed, sorting things out, consultant. <laughs> um, how has that journey changed your professional life? Did it, did it inform it in any way? And maybe it didn't, but I'm just curious because it almost feels like you completed your own backstory to some extent. Mm. So I'm wondering what that brought to your present day. Oh, that's a good question, Daryl. Um, so, you know, what I brought to my professional life is I think an even more, if that's possible, intense um, resolve to crack the case, so to speak. Um, so in terms of my coaching, as some of you know, I, I really, I want to figure it out. And if somebody's skeptical or if somebody um, has something that they're really struggling with and can't figure out, I, I really get in there and I want to do it. And now I really want to do that even more. I think I'm a, a problem solver at heart. And I think this journey you know, it was one puzzle. It was almost like a puzzle piece after one at a time of of just really putting it all together. Uh, so I think that that would that's what I would say. Question here. Um, hi, Karen. I just wanted to ask you about a bit more about your dad, actually, because as you know, I read the book last summer. So forgive me if I've forgotten no. some parts of it. I just I will, <laughs> please. I'm just really interested to know his mood and his sense in his later years, but also whether your mum revealed any part of his experience of this during their marriage. So um, what he was like was, as I said before, he he did have three depressions that I know of. One, and, and all of them could have been written off to him. Well, of course, he got fired from a job and he had three kids and he got pretty depressed. I remember I was very little, I was like six. And I remember my brother was gonna be going off to college in a few years and I that was an intense time, but okay, that all made sense. Then he had triple bypass surgery, and we all, well, uh, I, I think it's generally known that often after such a surgery, uh, people do, after facing their own mortality, and there's also some chemical reasons that people often go into depression. Okay, that was my dad again. And then there was this last time. But honestly, Katie, other than that, he was not this like depressed soul though, at all, at all. Um, so that's what made it all the more shocking. And, and I was very close to him and, and all the more kind of pushed my resolve. My mom, um, she, I don't know how much he confided in her about what was really deep for him. It sounds such a strange thing to say they were married 60 plus years, but you know, there are marriages and marriages, and I don't know. Um, my mother found my dad after the attempt, and uh, he had sort of created his own private little gas chamber in the garage, mm -hmm. and she came home and saw him lying next to the car, and she said, oh, that's funny. Rudy doesn't know anything about cars. Why is he lying there? So that kind of says a lot. She, it, it, there was a disconnect there. Um, but it definitely, that forever changed my mom too, obviously. So just, I think you had a. Oh, sorry, just on the theme oh. of your, of your dad, how, cause obviously you don't have his letters in because they were no. lost, oh, but of course wish. you had him though. Yes. Did he give a hint? What did, like he had, did this autobiography. How did he cover this period then in, in all of that without ever going into any of this? Or did so he, he did. No, no, he did. So, um, you know, what's interesting about my dad is for, so I was the, the kid, I was one of, I'm, I am one of three, I'm the baby. And I was always the one most interested in asking questions, et cetera. And if asked a question, he would answer. But he wasn't one of these people who always wanted to talk to you about the war and what he went through. 
no. If asked a question, he would answer. I can't remember his answer to this, but there was a, a time that I remember really clearly. Um, so we had that cabinet. I mean, this sounds pretty old fashioned, but the cabinet of family photo albums, right? Just stuffed in there. And in between those albums was an album from the liberation of Buchenwald of photos. And I remember asking, what's this, what's that? You know, they were the lampshades of human skin. They were, I remember those pictures that are missing now, but they are actually, he had donated them to uh, the Holocaust Museum. Um, so I remember bits and pieces asking him. I remember going with him to Berlin uh, for the dedication of um, the Abraham Geiger College and asking questions. But then what's so interesting is after that triple bypass surgery, it's almost like after that period of depression, he emerged, he was also retired, but that wasn't the reason. He became Mr. Out There Speaker. So I have the gift of his voice and videos that I, I, trans, I mean, I transcribed, meaning I sat and watched every video and wrote, I literally wrote them down. Um, every single one of them. And he was out there talking about it. Like, he talked to the Texas State Legislature. He would talk to synagogues. He would talk to kids in uh, at the Dallas Holocaust Museum that were there for a tour. But what's interesting is that he showed them, that picture I showed you, uh, the liberation of Buchenwald, um, he got the, there's a video and he got the footage of it and he would show that to the kids, but he would talk about it very surface, you know, kids are not kids. He didn't go deep. And I think that's what's painful for me is that I, I or anyone, I don't think really knew what was underneath, except I think there is one person who knew. And that is uh, the mother of my lifelong friend who I've known since I'm five. Um, and she was from Frankfurt. Uh, they only met because she saw herself. What, those, that series of pictures, there was another picture and uh, it's a longer story that's in the book. But anyway, they, my father met her mother and uh, her dad uh, later and they were going through pictures and she said, oh, who do you think that is in that picture? My dad said, I don't know, I was gone already. And my mother even writes in the back, what do you think of these girls? It was her. It was my friend's mother. She, her boyfriend lived in the same building they had moved to. Um, so wait, I got off on a tangent there that, um, where was I going? Oh, I think she was the one who said to me, uh, at my mother's 85th birthday party, she said, your mother's never been the same. And she said, I said, you know, I was saying my father, I said, I just still don't get it. And she said, it was the Holocaust. So she was the one who said, and I, I mean, they had a platonic, well, what do I know? I think a platonic relationship, but he, he, I think she was his, she and, and a, a rabbi that, um, not the same one I mentioned, were his confidants in life. And I think he must, I would like to think he opened up to them, but he, he was able to let a little of it out. So. Thank you for something very moving to listen mm. to. Um, I, what it reminded me so strongly of, and I'm just wondering how common this is, I got a similar story. My mother was from Austria mm. and I went back with my daughter ah, to Baden okay. near Vienna. And the same thing about, can we go in? You know, we knew the house. Yes. Um, standing outside and thinking, who can I ask? And when you were talking about <laughs> the, the bells, which one shall I ring? And then I was very lucky. Someone came up to me and said, um, can I help you? And I I explained and said, my, you know, I think my mother was 99 by then or something, still alive. And I said, I've come to see. And she said, would you like to come in? Oh, and of course, she happened to live in the same apartment that my mother had lived in. So that was, you know, so it was How similar. great. And I'm just wondering, I mean, I think there must be many stories like that of people going back. Um, so that was a mm. very, very similar experience. I just wanted to ask two factual questions, and I'm sure you've, other people might know. 
I, I couldn't remember what you said about where you found the letters. That's one thing. And the second thing is, I don't know whitepages.com. What oh. it? And what's the equivalent? Can somebody tell, tell her? It's an online phone book. Oh, a phone book? Yeah. Oh, online. I oh, I see. Oh, I see. Online. Right. Okay. Yes. And, so and, the letters, yeah. um, the letters I had seen, I think, once before. But in the 1990s, my dad uh, came to New York. He actually came without my mom. I can't remember why he had come up. But at any rate, um, he came down to breakfast one morning and he had under his, uh, he was carrying this very, this disintegrating uh, green Pendaflex folder. And I said, dad, what do you have there? And he said, oh, it's some letters. And I said, yeah. And he said, yeah, I'm going to the Leo Beck Institute today. The Leo Beck Institute is, is an institute for German Jewish uh, archives, research, et cetera. So I said, really? I said, well, I want to see that. So he opens it up and there are these letters. And I said, dad, no, they can have a copy. I, I'm not, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't say that here, but, <laughs> but I wasn't ready to, I wasn't ready to give them up. And I said, dad, what about like letting them have a copy? And he said, well, and do what? And I said, I'll take them. I said, I, I, I don't, I mean, one day maybe. And he said, well, what are you going to do with them? And literally, this is in the 1990s. I, the furthest thing from my mind was any of what I just shared with you. I said, I don't know. He said, you can't read them. I said, that's true. I can't. I had studied German. I had read Faust, but you know, you don't use it, you lose it. So I, I, it's true. I said, I don't know. But dad, those were written in your mom's and dad's with their hands, I, I, that's what you have left from them. I, I, it, no. And he said, well, then you come with me. So I said, okay, I'll come with you. And eventually we may do something with donating, but let's ask them if they would take a copy. So, so that's uh, what we did. And that's how I ended up. And they said to me, which I'm sure, uh, Toby, you'll appreciate. I remember when I went to pick them up three weeks later, they tried to convince me that I should take the copy and they should have the originals, <laughs> which I understand. And I was very gracious. And I said, really, I want them. And actually, to be honest, Toby, they were, they, it was, uh, you know, a 20 minute conversation. And, and the fellow said to me, uh, you're not going to know what to do with these. And I said, I'm going to figure it out. I went home and I spent literally close to a thousand dollars back then for these archival sleeves, archival binders, white gloves. I mean, I was determined, you know, to take good care. And I have, um, although I'll share with you a, a two second kind of, I mean, it's not humorous, but it's a sign of the times. Um, I've been living in, I live in Vermont and in Brooklyn and spent much of the pandemic in Vermont and, and just came back to Brooklyn in December after quite some time there. And that's where the letters had been with me. And we were packing the night before and I thought, well, gee, we're going back to Brooklyn for like a number of months. I mean, the letters, what do I do? And I really didn't know what to do. I thought, well, and we're in the process of some moving and painting. Well, maybe they're not so safe with the moving and painting, but I can't leave them here. Like, what if something happens to me here? So I actually called a friend who is, um, she works for uh, the Brooklyn Historical Society and knows of these things. And I called her and I said, Marsha, I'm in a little bit of a panic. I don't know what to do with the letters. Do, do I take them with me? Do I leave them here? And she said, honestly, she said, I know they're kind of like you want to tuck them in every night, but leave them. They're going to be okay. But it, it really was a moment for me. I, um, I really didn't know what to do. And I felt like I was uh, maybe being irresponsible to leave them alone. Um, that's how attached I've gotten to those letters. Anyway. Can I just, well, was that before you'd actually had them translated? No, no, that was I'm embarrassed to tell you that oh. was like two months ago. That was three oh, months ago. Oh, sorry. I mean, it was just, just, it was, uh, yeah, it was really interesting. It was a yeah. pandemic related yes. issue, yeah. you know? Do you have a question, sir? No. Um, well, I applaud you, first of all, for taking such good care of these letters. And uh, <laughs> it's especially important, actually, because so ma many of um, these letters are written on very fragile paper. And in 50 years, they will be incredibly rare items, and um, they give us such uh, an, a, a specific kind of insight into this history. It's very, very important that they're preserved. So you're doing, you've done a great job I'm there. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Excellent. So did we have any last questions online? 
No? Well, in that case, uh, I'm going to conclude by thanking you all for joining us tonight, but especially um, thanking Karen Baumcourt Gordon for a fascinating talk. <laughs> And Karen, I think you'll be happy to stay um, to sign any books. And also we have some books for sale so, and we have some refreshments as well. So please do join us. And there's a bookmark you can take. Too. There is also a bookmark you can take. Thank you. Had a, had a little something. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so, you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you.